Jasmine killed her. He cut her fucking head off. And he's guilty. Blood would have spurted out 12, 15 feet. A big slice into raw meat, but red, so you can see that it's flesh. This young man died in a bloody heap, staring at a helpless woman. I can be the keeper of the horror. So this is how it started, with this jury notice that came in April. And everybody I talked to said, I just throw those things away. And I couldn't really do that, even though I did let it sit around on my desk all summer long. So when I finally sent it in, I got this official summons for the very next week, September 19th. Now, I knew that jury selection was going on for the Simpson civil case, but I didn't really make the connection because I just rarely think that anything of any significance has anything to do with me. So I'm driving down to Santa Monica looking for the courthouse on the map and I saw those tents and cameras and all those crowds and I drove right past because this is LA. I thought it was a movie shoot. So I turned into this big official looking building and I said, I've got this jury summons and I'm looking for the courthouse. And the guard said, you want to be with them over there. Oh, this is that. So by the time I got over there, just getting from the parking lot, and being one of the ones allowed to walk down the sidewalk with the crowds behind the barricades was like getting into Studio 54. The first thing they told us was that we had to sign a form saying whether this would be a medical or a financial hardship. So I'm thinking, I could do this. Because I work freelance designing scenery and lighting. I never work in December and January anyway. I just lay around. So I could do this. That night, I had a meeting with some producers who wanted me to design a set. So I took out my little jury badge, and all I'm allowed to say is it's a high-profile case, potential juror, Santa Monica Courthouse, may take several months. And I said, you know, they're going to pick me for this this jury in Santa Monica. And so, of course, they knew what I was talking about, that it was the Simpson case. And the woman said, oh, Dina, they call 4,000 people. They're not going to pick you. And I don't know how, but it came right out of my mouth. I just said, you don't understand. This was decided before I was born, because I knew it. That first day, I knew I would be selected. The individual uh, jury selection like this, where you bring one juror in the courtroom at a time, always takes a long time. So you don't poison the other jurors by the comments of any one juror. Once again, race playing a major issue in jury selection. Jury selection took about a month. The first questionnaire was 20 pages, all about the criminal trial and all the publicity. It was like taking a test that I was flunking because I was so in the dark about all this. Because the feeling I had had during the criminal trial was like when everybody in the whole country was watching Dallas and I didn't. 
I thought, Miss Ellie shot JR. And then they ask the question about the Bronco chase, where you were, what you were doing. And I didn't even know it had been going on. The, uh, five freeway, past the 55 freeway. O.J. Simpson is believed to be in the white Bronco that you see in the center of your picture, followed by as many as nine orange cars. Hey, I'm no, I'm do it. I'm Nicole, that's all I'm going to do, that's all hey, I'm listen, to do. think about everybody I else, all right? I can do it on a freeway, I can do it in a field, I want to do it at a grave, I want to do it at my house. You're not going to do anything. So then they ask, have you ever expressed any opinion about the guilt or innocence of O.J. Simpson? And I said, yeah. I've expressed them all. Some days guilty, some days not guilty, depending on who I'm talking to. Hey, Buster, the game, Buster. Remember, the victim. And some days I was just convinced that there'd been a big frame up. 100% not guilty. Who framed OJ? I don't know. Best of luck, man. Best of luck, man. Best of luck. You the man, we love you. But most often, who the hell knows? So the first questionnaire eliminated all but like a hundred people. We had to go back in and fill out another questionnaire, another 22 pages. And this was all about yourself and your personal experiences with the police. And I know I must have sounded like country come to the big city. Because when they ask about any negative experiences with the police, the only thing I could say was, when I was a teenager in my hometown in Mississippi, the police would follow us real close when we were driving my dad's car, because he was real well known around town for speeding. My opinions about interracial marriage, well, I just think marriage is a bad idea to start with. And finally, your opinions about O.J. Simpson as a person, until this happened, I thought he was an ex-basketball player. So I think, being ignorant of the criminal trial and some infantile idea of athletics in this country, I think they just must have thought I was some vacant-minded slate who they could really mold my mind. One of the things I suspect they were thinking was, she's got a racial mixture we might be interested in. What is that? Is she black or is she white? Or some mixture? Because I know everybody, when they meet me, that's what they're thinking. What is she? And the only people who are honest at all are little kids who just ask, Miss Mullen, are you black or white? So after days of this, finally, there's just this instant when very casually, one side says, this jury is acceptable to us as presently constituted. And the other side doesn't object. And we had to stand up really fast and we're sworn in and we have to promise not to talk to anybody and listen to all the evidence and don't form any opinions. And now go back downstairs and the deputies will tell you what to do each day and where to park. And so we're jammed in this little hall downstairs. It's right near where they keep the prisoners. And it was the first time that we even got to introduce ourselves by our name instead of our number, and so, hi, I'm Dina. I guess we're gonna be spending some time together. And that's when I got to be juror number five. arguments both outside and inside the courthouse, signaling the start of O.J. Simpson's second trial. But inside was again accused of being a double murderer. In opening statements, the defense is basically assaulting and attacking the character of Nicole Brown Simpson. Actually, going to jury duty every day was kind of like having a job. Because you had to go every day and stay all day and not leave. Now, as an artist working freelance and on my own schedule pretty much my whole life, I had not been this tightly controlled since I was in grammar school because you're told when to be there, stand in this part of the hallway, wait right there, be quiet, 
Now go in that room, pay attention, take notes, use only these notebooks, and now it's time to take a break. Here's the time for your lunch. At the end of the day, they put you on the bus and you go home. So I had to decide real early that if I didn't just give myself over to this controlling process, I was going to be really frustrated. Even though we had no control, we had all the power. Because everything being said and done in that room was for our benefit. And it wasn't a very big room at all. The judge was maybe 10, 12 feet away. And the witness box, if somebody were sitting in there, I could have just popped them with a rubber band. And the lawyers were right here in front of us with Fred Goldman, Dan Petricelli, and then beyond them with Simpson and his lawyer, Bob Baker. And beyond that was the audience with all the families, and then all the press. And we couldn't do one thing to indicate what we were thinking, how we were feeling, or responding to what was being said, because we were on display like animals in a zoo. Everybody was watching us, hoping to get some sign of what we were thinking. I mean, you couldn't even like squirm around in your chair. Or maybe you had some bad chicken at lunch and had a funny look on your face. Because if you did anything, they would just get big eyes and the reporters would just start writing things down. I saw two of the uh, 12 jurors uh, who were uh, teary-eyed. The jury couldn't help but see that. They didn't look uptight or anything like that. They must not talk to anyone. They must not conduct any of their own research. Well, sure, you would like to have the jury uh, relate. The jury is being very methodical. We tried really hard to just turn to stone so we could resist them. The decedent was wearing a short uh, black dress that was bloodstained and a pair of uh, black panties. Nine days into the trial is when we saw the autopsy photos. And after that, everything changed. Because let me tell you, there was something to see. And how they had them displayed so that the families didn't have to look at them they were here, so we had to turn into the audience and right into the press, who were just gawking at us, trying to get our reaction. And there was one juror who wouldn't look at them, and the judge had to say, this is evidence. You have to look. These are the drawings that I made from the photos of Ron Goldman lying on the autopsy table. got all these cuts here and here, here, all over his arms, and these big, huge gashes on his neck. And the thing is, about these wounds, it's like a big slice into raw meat. They're just laid open. They're all clean, but red, so you can see that it's flesh. And this little thing right here, this is what they said killed him. It's tiny. They said the knife went in five inches 
and pierced his aorta and his blood pressure fell and he collapsed and died. These photos of Nicole Brown. We had seen photos of her that very afternoon at her daughter's recital. She is a beautiful woman, very California looking. She's got this great tan. But in this photo of her, her skin is so drained of blood that it's like paper. It's this white. Because they said she bled out. That's how they knew that she was down on the ground when she was killed because all of her blood is in a big puddle underneath her. that the pressure in the heart is so great that if she had been standing up when she was cut, that the blood would have spurted out 12, 15 feet. And that's why there was hardly any blood on O.J. Simpson, because she was down on the ground and she bled out. And it's this photo right here. You can actually see her windpipe. It's right here, it's like a piece of hose. It's been cut. It's just sliced and laid wide open. There was another photo when I was looking at the contact sheet and she's laying on the table and they've got her head bent all the way back so you can actually see how deep this cut is. And it's like a Pez dispenser. It's bent so far back. Because they said the knife actually nicked her spinal cord back here and her head is barely attached to her body. That's how deep the cut was. And it's these photos that I keep in my mind when I think about her, about how her head got cut off. And keep them so close, it's, in my mind, it's like where I put the photos of my family in this photo album in my mind. That's how intimate I feel towards them. But before that, they were just dead bodies, just evidence. From that moment on, everything I did had to do with the trial. Sitting in that courtroom with O.J. Simpson. Someone tracked white paint through the theater. I saw bloody shoe prints. Standing in my kitchen, cutting up an orange, I see this knife, it's 5 8 inch. Driving down the freeway, listening to the radio, that Beatles song. I'd rather see you dead, little girl, than to be with another man, you 
better keep your head, little girl. You won't know where I am. And I lost my breath. I almost wrecked my car. You're so isolated in your mind. The only thing you can do is write it all down. And that's what I did. I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. The day O.J. Simpson took the stand, that courtroom was jammed. O.J. Simpson took the witness stand promptly at 9 o'clock this morning. at times when questioned about domestic violence. And he said the two shared a strong physical, sexual relationship. Slapping or punching Nicole. In fact, he said, quote, it didn't happen. It when looked he like he was somewhat making it up as he was going along. In this moment, it's one of those moments of real life drama that's so much better than anything anybody could write or put in a movie or put on stage because he was so there and he's really big, which was one of the first things I had noticed about him is he's got this really big head. I mean, literally, it's like this big. And he's got these big hands, and he makes these big fists. So Dan Petricelli is asking him about the domestic violence and beating his wife. He's O.J. Simpson. I think you know his record. Could you just send somebody okay. over here? Hey, what is he doing there? He just drove up again in a white Bronco. But first of all, he broke the back door down to get in. Okay, just stay on the line. I don't want to stay on the line. He's going to beat the shit out of me. Wait a minute. Does he have any weapons? I don't know. 422 125 is he inside right yeah, now? Yeah. Okay, the kids are sleeping. You think he's still going to hit you? I don't know. And they have these big photos up on the display screen of her with all these bruises. And he says, look at that. Did you do that? And Simpson goes, well, I don't know. We were, we were wrestling. I had her in a headlock, and we were wrestling. And he's got his fist like this, and Petrocelli just looked really surprised and, and said, with those fists in her face, you were wrestling? And he just took his hands and put them right down between his legs, and he got angry. The vein in his head starts pulsating, and his jaw is clenched, and his eyes go black. And I thought he was going to fly right over the witness stand. But later, after lunch, when he got back on the stand, he is so calm. And I have written in my notes, Medicated? He looks drugged. But we couldn't even talk about it for two months. When we're in deliberations and we're talking about that day and one of the other jurors has written, Valium? So, day after day, we would go in and get all this information, all about DNA and cell phone records and police logs and hear all this testimony all about 
back gates and front gates and dogs and blankets and ice cream and who went where and what they carried and how long it took and who didn't go somewhere else. And we couldn't talk about any of it. And we couldn't ask any questions. The one thing that we all had in common was the one thing we couldn't talk about. We couldn't even mention his name. And there were a lot of times when we didn't even get into the courtroom and we had to keep ourselves busy. Somebody brought in a Jenga game, somebody else brought in Yahtzee, and my contribution was to bring in coloring books, enough for everybody to color with pencils and crayons and origami paper. And these were the things that I colored. And I spent days on each one. This was early on. It's kind of nice and simple. This one, during the time that Simpson was testifying, was kind of dark. And this, I think, is my favorite one. It was finished at the day we finished the verdicts. And having all these toys around was like being in kindergarten. I even brought in a blanket and a pillow so I could nap right after lunch. I didn't care if people watched me drooling on the floor, just crawled up under the table and snoozed. If you had to point to one thing, the shoes. FBI photography expert is expected to testify that the photos are real. OJ could never explain it. The day the Bruno Mali shoes were introduced, you could tell something was up. We didn't even get into the courtroom till 11, 11.30. And when we got in there, everybody was all in a lather. I mean, the judge was all red in the face, and the lawyers were huddled up and making lists and calling out evidence items into the record, and then there they were. These 30 photos of Simpson wearing those Bruno Mali shoes. They were huge. And an enlargement of his feet, this big. And at first, all I could think of is, they spent a lot of money on this. The real power of these photos was when Simpson was on the stand and Petrocelli is asking him photo by photo, is this your head? Yeah, that's my head. Is this your jacket? Yeah, that's my jacket. Are these your pants? Well, I'm kind of a little bit more snappy dresser than that, kind of baggy. Are these your shoes? No. Those aren't my shoes. Every single photo and then the blow up. And this takes all afternoon on and on about pants and shoes and belts. And every time he got to the shoes, he says, no, those are not my shoes. And that he never owned those ugly ass shoes. And just listening to this guy, it reminded me of listening to one of my nephews when he was about seven, and he would kick his brother underneath the table and say, I didn't do anything. Those aren't my shoes. I didn't kill her.
so finally, it's the end of January, and we're in closing arguments. And Petricelli is responding to this comment that the defense lawyer, Bob Baker, had made that anybody with $200 could bring a civil suit against anybody. So he reaches in his pocket, pulls out this big wad of 20s, and he says, we would gladly give this back if we could see Ron Goldman come walking through those doors. And for a split second, everybody turned to look. I mean, all the lawyers that were facing the judge and all the reporters looked back over their shoulders like expecting something. And I know I really thought that I would see this tall, lanky kid just come sauntering in. And it was just the barest flicker of hope. You know, like when somebody's dead and you think you hear their voice in the next room and for about that long you think they're not dead. Except the only person who didn't look back was Fred Goldman. He was sitting there watching us and he just looked down. It wasn't reported in the press that way. After the trial was over and I read about that, they told all about the big dramatic moment when he shook this big wad of money. But this other moment was the first time in the whole trial that I ever had any sense of Ron Goldman as a real young man. By the time we got to deliberations, we were so ready to talk. And at first we had to gossip about some of the things we saw, like this one lawyer who'd quit wearing his wedding ring and had his wife left him or he just got fat. It was over an hour and a half before anybody could even say O.J. Simpson's name. And I remember the exact minute it happened. One of the jurors said, if O.J. Simpson, and I just jumped, my heart got stuck in my throat, and I thought, this is it. This is what we've been waiting for. And there was so much evidence. All this stuff was jammed in this tiny room with all of us in this huge table. This room was half the size of my bedroom. So we had everything out on the table, and we had those gloves. And I put them on because I wanted to see how they fit. And I could see how really big they were on my hands. And they had holes in them. I wanted to try to think about how those holes got there. And I guess I kind of just forgot I had them on because I kept them on and was talking and talking about something else, I guess for a really long time, because finally somebody said, Dina, my God, what are you doing? Take off those gloves. There was one guy on the jury who did not want to go back to work. He had to have an hour and a half at lunch, two breaks in the morning, two breaks in the afternoon, and I don't know if he was scared to go back to work, or if he just never wanted to go back to work ever. Because he just wanted to stretch this out like he was on vacation. And there was a moment during deliberations when he said, now I know he killed her, but, and I, I just lost my mind and I went completely insane. I don't know what the but was gonna be, but I reached over and I grabbed the big book of autopsy photos and I was just flipping through till I found the picture I wanted and I said, killed her? What do you mean killed her? He cut her fucking head off. 
and he's guilty. And I just threw the book at him. And the foreman says, sit down and shut up. And this guy goes, don't tell her to shut up. And this other guy goes, yeah, you shut up and quit calling us stupid. You've been insulting us all week. And we were just yelling like it was the most important thing we'd ever done. And at that moment, it was. And it was all such hard work. I went home every night just spent and would eat and get in my pajamas and go to bed at about 8.30 and dream about all the evidence. And after five days, we were ready to vote. And the first vote was unanimous. And I think everybody was surprised that we all agreed. Now, the judge had ordered us to deliberate till 5 o'clock every day. And here it was, 3.45, and we thought, great, we get to go home early. But that's not what happened. We buzzed twice, which is the signal that we've got a verdict. And the judge took our verdict form and sent us back downstairs. And we had to wait for all the lawyers to get to the courthouse with all the families. Since we were used to leaving at 5 o'clock, they hadn't planned dinner for us. And, you know, we're getting kind of cranky and kind of freaked out because now we can hear what's going on outside. I mean, we can hear the crowd of people crossing the street. And it's really frightening because the helicopters were above and we can hear this big roar going around to the front of the courthouse. And still we're just waiting until finally we overhear on the walkie-talkies. The Goldmans and the Browns are in the building and we're ready for the jury. At 7.15, they march us back upstairs and into the courtroom, and it's about 90 degrees in there. It's a county courtroom. They turned off the air conditioning at 4.30, and I am just sweating, and I'm all woozy because I haven't eaten, and I sit down, and there's Petrocelli, sitting right there facing Fred Goldman, and they both just looked awful, like they were going to throw up or pass out. And I didn't want them to have to wait another minute. I wanted to say, it's fine. It's going to be OK. And it took a while for the bailiff to get everybody settled down because it's just jam-packed with crowds all the way, wall to wall. So finally. Everybody settled, the judge comes in, and he asks for the verdict form from the foreman, hands over this big envelope with our verdict, and when the clerk reads the verdict, there is this big huge applause and shouting, and the judge banged his gavel on his desk and said, quiet in here, I'll clear this courtroom. A loud roar goes up as the jury decision is read. The jury has found O.J. Simpson willfully and wrongfully caused the death of Ronald Goldman. The jury has found O.J. Simpson committed battery against Nicole Brown Simpson.
and this was the first time that I ever felt anything towards O.J. Simpson. And it wasn't really anger. I just thought, I can call him a killer to his face. I've never personally shaken hands with a murderer. Yeah. It's good to see you. Thank you. Very nice meeting you. I've never personally shaken hands with a murderer. Yeah. It's good to see you. Thank you. Very nice meeting you. Does that hurt? And I just felt like poking him and saying, you cannot lie to me. Because what was he going to do? Kill me? Other than that, I really have no feelings towards him. I knew that after all these months of being protected and sheltered, that we were going to be assaulted by the press. And it was terrifying. Leaving the courthouse, we're in two vans just tearing through Santa Monica with this long string of reporters behind us and helicopters. So the deputies pulled the vans into this underground parking lot to get us all into one van. And one of the jurors just ran off through this parking lot. Just, they couldn't stop her. And she went and got on a city bus. So that by the time we got back to our secret parking location, it seems like there were hundreds of reporters around this cyclone fence trying to get at us. We couldn't even hug goodbye or say, see you later because we wouldn't see each other anymore. We didn't even know anybody's last name. So I just got in my car and took off. And that night I went to hide out at my sister's house because around my apartment was just swarming with reporters. So I put on this blonde wig and we drove around the apartment building around and around eating ice cream and just laughing and watching these guys just swarm all around looking for me. Because it was surreal and it got really weird real fast because the Today Show called up and they wanted me on Saturday morning and I had to work on Sunday and they said, oh, that's not a problem. We'll fly you out on Friday and fly you back on Saturday night. Were you also surprised at how much attention was focused on you after? And we're watching every movement you make. Either of you have plans to do books? I had four years of college, three years of graduate school. I never turned in a paper on time. I don't, I mean, I I don't think I either. Even though I thought I was really prepared for this, still it was like being shot out of a cannon and just flying through outer space. This hour of Lee's life after being a juror, deciding someone else's fate forever changed my own. Come on back and join us. From the Lee's show, I got this little radio shaped like a TV. See, it's not a TV, it's a radio, but it's shaped like a TV because she's on TV. Would it make you uncomfortable or frighten you to come face to face with him, Dina? I don't think so. I wasn't really very interested in him before, and I'm really not interested in him now. She's the tell it like it is lady. There was this large group of people who went to the courthouse every day to watch us and thought they got to know us. And they were like our fan club, because they had a couple of parties for us after it was all over. Hey. I'm Arbster, just good to see you. Wow, thank you so much for coming back. And they gave us these t-shirts. Although this one kind of creeps me out and I've never really worn it. Don't even keep it with my clothes. When I think about what I know and how it's changed my life, 
because I could, look at those pictures and not turn away. And I could take those images and keep them and make them precious to me that when the world wants an answer, I can take them and I can say, see, this is what there is, and this is all there is. This young man he came walking down that sidewalk and he died in a bloody heap. with his eyes open, staring at a helpless woman in her bare feet and with her head cut off. Do you see? This is what there is. This is the answer. So in that way, I can be not the keeper of the flame because it's reserved for the families that with their memories and sorrow of them living. But I can be the keeper of the horror 